Hi guys, I'm Lauren Smith and I'm studying theoretical physics in Trinity. I'll be taking you through to 2021's higher level question 10. This question is all about magnetism and it's worth 56 marks. So let's go. So we are going to begin by starting off with parts one, two and three, in which we are told that a current flowing through a conductor creates a magnetic field around it. Part one, we're asked to define what a magnetic field is. All you have to say here is that it is the region where magnetic forces can be experienced. Just stating the statement in full will give you three marks. Now, just to visualize what a magnetic field is, I've drawn a little diagram to the right of me. And just to visualize what we're dealing with here, I've drawn the magnetic field of a bar magnet. You've probably... I'd say you've definitely seen this before and where the forces can be felt is along in, in the region of these purple lines. Just a disclaimer, you won't get any extra marks for this diagram. It's just here for your benefit. Now, in part two, we're asked to describe an experiment to show the magnetic field around the conductor. And remember, we were told that this conductor is a current carrying conductor i.e. a wire. Whenever you hear that, just think of a wire. It's the most easiest scenario that you can think of. Now, moving on to the actual experiment, the apparatus gets you three marks. The apparatus is as follows. I have a sheet of cardboard here and a current carrying wire just going through it. And I have my plotting compass on the cardboard and the magnetic field lines are being traced out by the compass here. Remember to make sure to label your diagram, but also show the direction of the current as well. You can either have this current going up or down, but make sure you have the magnetic field lines pointing in the correct direction, which can be done by using the right hand grip rule. More on that will follow throughout the video. Now you're going to get three marks for your method. My method is as follows. It's just basically explaining in words the diagram. That's what I always found very helpful. What are you doing? Walk them through how you find and map out the magnetic field lines. So what's happening is you have to place the compass on the sheet of cardboard near the wire. You mark with dots or you can draw on the cardboard both ends of the compass needle. Both ends, very important. Then you move the compass so that the south pole is at the dot that is marked by the north pole and you mark the other end with the dot and you repeat this until the dots make your way around the cardboard and you finally join the dots up. Okay, something similar to that. You can put your own spin on it like I've done here. Just walk them through the experiment and that will get you your three marks. Finally, for your last three marks are for your observations. What do you observe in this experiment? This is basically the fundamentals of being a physicist, conducting an experiment and drawing your conclusions. The observations are the magnetic field lines. Trace out a circle. You've seen this in the apparatus diagram. Diagrams are extremely important. That would be my biggest tip. Draw a great diagram and the words and observations will follow. The next observation, we'll be talking about the direction of the magnetic field and it points in the direction of the south pole of the compass. And this is true as we've seen in the example with our bar magnet. Now, moving on to part three, which follows really, really nicely from part two. And we are asked to draw the shape and the direction of the magnetic field. And we've kind of already done this in the diagram of the apparatus for our experiment. But to make it explicitly clear that we know what we're talking about, I have drawn a diagram as follows. Sticking with my current convention, you can ha have the current going up. Just make sure that your magnetic field lines are pointing in the right direction as given by the right hand rule. How I determined this, I just pointed my thumb of my right hand downwards and the rest of my fingers curled inward, showing that the magnetic field lines go around in clockwise direction. Very important to label all aspects of your diagram. As I have here, the motion and the direction of the magnetic field lines, what my current carrying conductor is, and also what way the current is flowing. 
you get three marks for direction and three marks for the shape, i.e. circles. Moving on to parts four and five. We are told that when placed in an external magnetic field, a current carrying conductor may experience a force. And in part four, we're told that the magnitude of this force depends on a number of factors. And we're asked to name three of them. I have four here, a little bit extra, but put as many down as possible. Anything that you can think of, you won't lose marks for doing this. And it's more likely that you'll gain marks, which is what we want. So if, even if they only ask for three and you think of four, put four down. If one of them's wrong, one of them's wrong. It doesn't, you don't lose any marks here. It doesn't say so in the marking scheme. So we have magnetic flux density, current, length, and the angle, which is between the magnetic field and the current. For every factor you name, you get two marks. Before moving on to the derivation in part five, let's look at the formulae we will use in this part. And we're going to turn to page 62 of our formula and tables books. We're going to look at the formula for a force on a current carrying conductor. And we're also going to look at the formula for the force on a charged particle. For part five, we're asked to derive an expression for the force F experienced by a charge Q traveling with velocity V. And it is perpendicular to a magnetic field of flux density V. So the goal here is that we need the force F in terms of Q, V and B. In the formula and tables book, as we've just seen before, we actually have an equation that is of this very form, namely the formula F is equal to Q, V, B. And we're told in the formula and tables book that the velocity is in fact perpendicular to the magnetic field of flux density B. So our end goal is this very formula, but how do we arrive at it? Moving on to the derivation, I'm going to start with the formula F is equal to I L B, where I is the current in the current carrying conductor, L is the length of the current carrying conductor, i.e. the wire, and B is the magnetic field flux density. So the next step in our derivation is just to make a couple of observations. Since this current carrying conductor, i.e. the wire, is carrying a current, which is a stream of charged particles by definition, our charges that it is carrying and that will be traveling at velocity V are electrons. Now, the definition of current is charge per unit time, i.e., I is equal to Q over T, where Q in this case is the charge of the electron and T is the time taken by it. This is the definition of current. I would recommend to learn this formula off it as, as it is not explicitly in the formula and tables book. Now, these charges have velocity V. We need the velocity V in our final formula. And therefore, the time taken to travel the length of the conductor L is just T is equal to L over V. And I'm just going to put L is equal to VT, as we can sub this directly into our force formula here. How many marks have we picked up thus far? Three for this formula and three for including this formula and this formula. You need them both down. Now, all I did here was sub in all of the expressions for our variables and we can simplify it back down. As stated in the question, we need the force in terms of the charge Q, V and B. Not of time. However, the T's divide out, giving us our final three marks. Now, like I did here, I predicted what the final form should look like by looking at all the different formulas in the formula and tables book and kind of picking it out. So I'd really, really recommend to do this as a tip. It can make your life so much easier and it can get you thinking about how you're going to go the derivation. Moving back to our main question, we have a square loop of side five centimeters. It enters a magnetic field of flux density 0.4 Tesla, and it's traveling at a velocity of six meters per second, parallel to one side of the square. The square is perpendicular to the direction of the field. All this information will be needed for part six of this section of our question. 
Now, before conducting this calculation, we turn again to page 62 of the formula and tables book, where we will be looking at the formula for induced EMF and the formula for magnetic flux. In part six, we are asked to use Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction to calculate the average EMF induced in the loop as it enters the field. So let's write down firstly Faraday's law, which is just that the voltage here or the induced EMF, which what is what drives a current, which is equal to the change in magnetic flux with respect to time. This formula, putting it down, will get you three marks. Never forgetting the golden rule in doing your physics leaving cert exam is to put every single formula that you think is relevant down because you can just copy them from the formula tables book. You will pick up marks. It's as simple as. Now, the other formula that we will be using is that for magnetic flux itself. In order to find the induced average EMF in the formula here, we would need to find the change in magnetic flux. Again, stating this formula, three marks. All from copying it down in the formula and tables book. Again, like I said, handy, handy marks. So what are we told? We're told that it's a square that we're dealing with. A square loop, which has a length of five centimetres. Now, centimetres, automatically, we cannot deal with. We have to deal with SI units in their entirety. So, converting this to metres, we get that the length is actually 0 0.05 metres. And you're to use this. Going by this, it makes sense to calculate the area as it is one of the factors in our magnetic flux formula. Since it's a square, it's just going to be the length squared. Remembering always to calculate in SI units. Okay, so putting this into our calculator, I'd always use brackets when you're using any sort of powers, indices, whatnot. And we get 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. Now we can actually calculate this magnetic flux up here because we do in fact have V. V is equal to 0 0.4 Teslas. So the magnetic flux is equal to V, which is 0 0.4, multiplied by the area A, which is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. Let's sub this into our calculator. As you can see here, don't really cancel anything on your screen when you're doing our calculations because you could store them and use them later. So inputting our values. So here's the magnetic flux density and this area is stored as an answer, which is so handy because we guaranteed not to make too many mistakes with our scientific notation and our negative powers and all such in putting it into the calculator. And that just gives us one times 10 to the power of minus three Weber's which will give us our next three marks. In order to find the average EMF, we're obviously going to need the time taken for a current to travel along a length or the side of the wire. And we are given the velocity, which is six meters per second. This is the velocity of the loop going through the magnetic field. Now, in our previous expression, in our derivation of part five, we know that the time taken for a current to travel along the side of the wire is equal to the side of the wire L over the velocity it is traveling. And this is the velocity of the induced EMF, which relates to the induced current as well. So brilliant, we already have the side, we already have the velocity, so we can find the time. Let's input this into our calculator. So 0 0.05 over 6, not too tricky. And it's a little bit long-winded of a number. Just give it to two or three decimal places. Perfect, now we can finally find the average EMF. Finding this time, by the way, will earn you your next three marks. Now to find the average EMF, we have that the average magnetic flux is 1 times 10 to the power of minus 3 Weber. And the time interval is 8.33 times 10 to the power of minus 3 seconds. 
Remember, we stored the time interval as an answer, which is very, very important because you don't want to be typing out that long. Decimal places, it ensures maximum accuracy. Being very careful now when you're inputting everything that you have correct scientific notation and your indices and all that. And there we have it. 0 0.12 is our answer given as 0 0.12 volts. Not forgetting your units, you will lose marks and giving us our final three marks. Lastly, we are told that the other law of electromagnetic induction is Lenz's law. This bit of information will cover us for part seven and eight. In part seven, we're asked to state Lenz's law and it goes as follows. The direction of the induced current, which will give you three marks, is such to oppose the change that calls it another three marks. The last three marks, that final phrase, really, really, really is important. And you'll see why in part eight. And in part eight, we're asked to explain how Lenz's law is a special case of the principle of conservation of energy. Basically, without Lenz's law, energy could be created. This will get you five marks. The reason it is so is without it, we would be able to induce the current with no change at all anywhere. So what Lenz's law is doing is we want to oppose any change in motion to restore neutrality and balance to the universe. 